Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Yeah. Um, hi. Yeah. So welcome to uh, the lunchtime seminar series of the geography department, geography department here in uh, Trinity College Dublin. Uh, my name is Tommy Gavin, and I'm a PhD candidate here in the department, and I'll be chairing the session today. Please note that the seminar is being recorded and uh, it'll be uploaded to the departmental communications channels in the next couple of days. Uh, today we're joined by a uh, new addition to the department, uh, Dr. Louis Gillet. Uh, Dr. Gillet started here in January on the REPEAT project, uh, which is funded by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Um, Dr. Gillet is working with the 19th century, uh, I believe, uh, Bog Commissioner maps to create baseline data on the original extent of peatlands in Ireland. Um, and he'll use that data to assess land use change over the last 200 years and to identify areas that could be rewetted under the government's climate action plan. Dr. Gillet earned his PhD at the Université Paris en Panthéon Sorbonne, looking at uh, bed load transport and obstacles to sediment continuity in uh, uh, Morvan rivers. Uh, so the seminar presentation will take about 40 minutes uh, ish, and uh, we'll open up to the floor then for a question and answer session. Um, so we ask you please mute your microphones and hold your questions for all that time, but please actually do put questions into the chat and we'll uh, 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 we'll get into them um, at the end. I'll, I'll mediate questions from the floor. But uh, it's my great honor to introduce here now Dr. Gillet. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tommy. Uh, and uh, all the uh, seminar team uh, for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity uh, to present uh, this repeat project uh, and at the same time to introduce myself to the department. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to, to show you uh, what will be my main occupation uh, here in Trinity as a postdoc researcher for the next three years. Uh, if I have time, I will give you more details about what I did before and what brought me here uh, at the end of the presentation. And so to start, uh, you can see from this uh, first slide that this, that this project uh, brings together many people, institutions, and stakeholders. Uh, it is funded, as uh, Tommy said, by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, and by the Environmental Protection Agency. The team project is made up of people uh, from uh, different universities uh, and with different perspectives and disciplines. Uh, John uh, is a physical geographer, John Connolly. Uh, he is the, uh, he's also a JS uh, specialist and he is the principal investigator uh, on this project. Katja Bridge uh, is working uh, here in 22. She is an environmental historian and Terry Morley uh, from the National University uh, of Ireland in Galway is both an ecologist and a physical geographer and he is the uh, project coordinator. In the second line, uh, you can read that Lisa Coleman, who has a master's degree in GIS and remote sensing, uh, is working uh, uh, for her PhD on this project. Billy Tomney is currently doing a PhD in environmental history on pit mining. She's uh, working as a research assistant on the project. And uh, as for me, uh, I am educated in geography and uh, more particularly in uh, physical geography. Okay. Just trying to go to the next slide. It was working uh, sooner. Sorry for that. Um, so uh, in this first slide, uh, I propose a, a quick overview of the uh, political and scientific context in which the, uh, the pro repeat project operates. Uh, I will start with a brief reminder uh, of the key role of uh, peatlands in climate change mitigation. And uh, for complementary information on this point, uh, I recommend to watch the uh, very instructive video made by a uh, Niger video presentation uh, made by Nigel Roulet uh, three, three weeks ago. Um, so uh, we know that uh, the peatlands only occupy a very uh, limited portion of the earth's surface, about 3%. And yet they account for 21-25% of the total soil organic carbon stock. It's important to, to keep in mind that these numbers are subject, are subject to little changes since uh, peatlands are still being uh, discovered or mapped for the first time. But uh, what is certain, however, is that uh, these large amounts of uh, carbon stocks were stored uh, uh, over 
thousands of years during which peat was accumulating and uh, peatlands were sequestering and capturing more carbon than they were emitting. The problem is that uh, studies show that a significant uh, proportion of peatlands have now been losing their function as carbon sink so that uh, the, at the global scale, there are already or uh, they soon be a net carbon source to the atmosphere. Okay, it works now. Um, this evolution from a uh, carbon sink to carbon source is uh, largely based on the changes uh, occurring in the, in the pit soils from dominantly uh, oxygen depleted anaerobic conditions uh, in uh, natural peatlands to uh, dominantly ox uh, oxygenated aerobic conditions in degraded peatlands where more CO2 is produced and uh, depending on the disturbance where uh, less or none is captured and sequestered. Um, these changes in uh, peat soil conditions uh, are not to be not to be able to exploit these uh, wet peat soils for agriculture, forestry, or peat extraction. And these drainage, drainage practices has logically led to water table drawdown. This lowering increases the part of the soil which is not permanently saturated with water, which is more oxygenated and uh, aerated. And uh, if the decrease in the anaerobic conditions reduces the production of methane, uh, it is more than counterbalanced by the development of uh, aerobic conditions, uh, which, which uh, greatly favors the production of CO2. And in the case of extracted peatlands, most of the time there is uh, even not a removal of, car of carbon from the atmosphere since the vegetation uh, has, been, uh, has been cut. To give you more um, indication about the uh, magnitude of this evolution, uh, it's good to know that, at the, uh, that in Western Europe, uh, the total amount of uh, peatlands that has, that has been degraded by human activities has been estimated at 90%. Globally, uh, at least 25% of peatlands have been affected uh, by agriculture, forestry, or peat extraction, according to the uh, Tropic Research Group from the University of Leicester. Um, of course, this transformation from carbon sink to carbon source uh, is a major development, development with huge stakes when we consider the, uh, the quantities of carbon contained in peatlands. And uh, faced with this evolution, many papers and uh, reports, scientific reports, uh, have demonstrated the importance of peatland preservation and peatland restoration. Um, also, yeah, some papers have, um, have proposed some very thought-provoking scenarios with and uh, without restoration measures. Uh, for example, here, you can read uh, the a range of the uh, remaining available budget for CO2 emissions to keep the air temperature rise to 1.5 degrees or at least to uh, below 2 degrees by 2100, so following the, the Paris Agreement. So that is to say, the remaining budget for CO2 emissions that must not be exceeded to uh, fulfill these uh, temperature objectives. Also, this budget is, uh, is based on the references found in the literature. Uh, it ranges from uh, 400 and 1600 uh, petagrams of CO2 equivalents. On the vertical axis, you can read the, uh, the portion of this budget that will be consumed by degraded peatlands in this graph and by all peatlands, uh, so uh, disturbed and undisturbed peatlands included in this graph. So the portion of this budget that will be consumed without or with restoration measures. And uh, already you can perceive the significant influence of these rehabilitation measures. Uh, on the left, for example, you can read that, uh, so this graph only considers the uh, drained uh, disturbed peatlands, and you can read that result restoration measures, so this gray area, uh, the share of, dra of drained peatlands in, uh, in the consumption of the budget will be uh, by 2100 between 10 and 40% uh, in function of the overall budget that is considered. This share is reduced to between two and 11% when uh, restoration measures are introduced. 
The B graph uh, so also includes uh, the, the intact peatlands, which of course uh, reduces immediately the share uh, of the uh, available CO2 budget that would be consumed by peatlands uh, because of the uh, mitigation effects of intact peatlands who act as carbon sink and uh, remove uh, carbon from the atmosphere. So this study, um, in the end, uh, along with many others, clearly highlight how essential it is to protect uh, the intact peatlands and to restore those that have been degraded. Um, now, if we uh, take a look uh, at Irish peatlands, uh, we can see uh, on this map uh, produced by uh, John Connolly and Nicholas Alben, uh, that they uh, occupy a significant proportion of the territory, about 21%. However, as with the rest of Western Europe, uh, they have been heavily impacted by human activities, uh, with uh, only between 15 and 25% of uh, intact peatland remaining. And uh, in fact, in a recent report, René Wilson and colleagues even state that there are no intact, intact raised bogs left in Ireland today. On a more political and regulatory level, uh, it is worthwhile to recall that uh, as a member of the European Union, Ireland is fully committed to the uh, Paris Agreement and to the Climate and uh, Energy Action Framework. Uh, the later sets a target of a minimum domestic reduction of, 50, of 40 percent uh, in, in net greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 compared to the uh, 1990 levels. Uh, and uh, in, actually, in July 2021, the European uh, Commission has adopted a series of um, legislative proposals for greenhouse gas reductions, which were this time redefined to a minimum of 55% below the uh, 1990 levels. Um, this, uh, this desire to balance uh, these uh, greenhouse gas fluxes has also been uh, recently um, underlined at the uh, national level with the uh, amendment to the uh, Climate Action and Low Carbon Development Bill, which uh, specifies this objective of net zero emissions by uh, 2050. Furthermore, what is uh, particularly important for us here um, is that under the Climate and Action, uh, sorry, under the Climate and Energy Action Framework, uh, the EU land use, land use change, and forestry regulation implement the commitment for each member state. Uh, to account for uh, greenhouse gas emissions and removal from the farmland use, and as a minimum, to balance these fluxes, possibly and directly uh, through uh, compensating action in the same uh, sector. So this means that uh, now the, uh, the land use sector is legally obliged to, um, to contribute to the national effort for greenhouse gas mitigation and sequestration. And of course, uh, there is uh, one area uh, of land use in Ireland where important steps can be made uh, relative to greenhouse gas dynamics. It is the management of peatlands. However, um, as uh, seen earlier, uh, most of the Irish peatlands uh, have been degraded. Uh, they have been uh, drained and modified for specific land use. Uh, agriculture, forestry, peat extraction for uh, fuel or horticulture. And therefore, uh, a part of them is now uh, covered, hidden by the uh, land cover and vegetation associated to this land use, whether it is croplands or grasslands for agriculture, or uh, conifers or deciduous trees for forests or forestry. Uh, as a consequence, today uh, it is uh, we are not able to know exactly and entirely the, the location and the extent of these converted peatlands, uh, neither their depth or uh, which land use uh, is above the ground. It is then uh, very difficult to quantify uh, their greenhouse gas stocks and dynamics and to know uh, what mitigation potential they represent. So this is really uh, in this context uh, and facing these questions that the uh, repeat projects uh, comes in and uh, makes sense. So how does yeah how does this uh, this repeat project intend to refine our knowledge of uh, the extent of peatlands and of converted peatlands in particular, and then contribute to improve uh, the estimation of their greenhouse gas and greenhouse gas stocks and dynamics. Uh, to do so, it consists in uh, using and combining historical maps from the 1810s with a recent geospatial data set 
search soil and then cover maps or high resolution aerial and satellite imagery with two key directions. Uh, first, uh, to assess the original extent of peatland prior to their wider scale uh, drainage and degradation, and from this baseline data to locate and characterize uh, the areas where there have been changes in land use and land cover over the next uh, 200 years. So that is to say, uh, to locate and characterize uh, the converted peatlands. And uh, this involves uh, delineating their boundaries measuring their uh, surface, surface extent uh, and their thickness and uh, assessing the uh, land use category uh, on the surface. Uh, there are two main applications uh, for this refined knowledge of, uh, of uh, peatlands. First, uh, as uh, mentioned earlier, and as uh, you might guess from the, uh, the project title, it is to progress the inventories of greenhouse gas stocks and dynamics, removals and uh, emissions for uh, peatlands and in particular for the part of converted peatlands that has not been considered to date. So this is a task that has already been of interest to uh, Irish scientists. Some earlier estimation estimates uh, were calculated by Thomlinson, by uh, Ethan and colleagues. However, this was before the last version uh, of the derived Irish peat map uh, produced by uh, John and Nicholas Solden in uh, 2009, which obtained a uh, larger extent of peatlands. More recently, Renaud Wilson and colleagues uh, found great also, also found greater amount of carbon stocks uh, in peatlands than uh, these previous studies. Uh, in addition to their own calculations of uh, carbon densities, the uh, derived Irish peatland was used and has then contributed to this refined estimation of carbon stock. So this really confirms uh, the value and interest of producing uh, an upgraded map of the, uh, of the peatland extent in Ireland, uh, an upgraded map that will incorporate the newly mapped areas of converted peatlands uh, that hopefully we will have uh, locate and characterize uh, with uh, historical maps and uh, recent uh, geospatial data. Uh, based on, uh, on this improved inventory of uh, greenhouse gas stocks and dynamics uh, for peatlands, the second application of our work would be to help to identify and locate uh, the most uh, relevant sites for restoration and revating projects. So why revating? Um, uh, it is in, in a way to have a sort of uh, reverse effect uh, to that uh, of drainage. That is to say, uh, the water table is raised instead of lowered and the uh, water saturated anaerobic conditions are allowed to develop again. As a result, uh, at least the uh, CO2 production must decrease. Uh, and in the base case scenario, uh, the carbon balance becomes negative again, with uh, greenhouse gas removals turning to be higher uh, than emissions. And um, these relating projects do work. Uh, many examples are given uh, in the action plan written by O'Connell and colleagues and published by the uh, Irish Peatland Conservation Council. And for instance, uh, in the five-year monitoring of the Moya Woodbook uh, by Renaud Wilson and, colleague, and colleagues, uh, the different CO2 dynam dynamics were uh, between uh, drained and related areas were clearly shown. Uh, in, the, in this case, uh, the relating program um, uh, not only led to a reduction of CO2 emissions, but it has also uh, restored uh, the uh, carbon sink function of the bog in the related area with uh, uptake of CO2 by the peatlands exceeding the uh, loss of CO2 to the atmosphere. And here, what is particularly interesting also is that uh, the uh, net uptake uh, increases significantly two years after the, the program began. Secondly, um, although it is maybe less systematical, uh, uh, Revating can also help to restore uh, ecological processes and uh, ecosystem services that are typically provided by peatlands in terms of flow regulation of uh, fauna and flora habitats or regarding the uh, amenities associated to uh, recreative, educational or uh, artistic practices. So now I'm going to show you uh, some of the uh, essential material that uh, we will be using for this project. Uh, most of the uh, historical maps that we are going to study are those of the Bob Commission, 
So what, uh, what is the, the Bob Commission? It is a, a group of uh, nine commissioners, uh, the board uh, that uh, was formed from uh, 1809, appointed by the British government and charged with, uh, I quote, investigating and examining the nature and extent of the various pit bogs in Ireland and the possibility of draining and cultivating them. Very quickly, these uh, nine commissioners uh, appointed uh, nine and later 10 principal surveyors to uh, survey and map accurately the bogs of Ireland and to propose uh, drainage, drainage schemes uh, for their reclamation. Um, among the, uh, the surveyors that, that were recruited for the, to carry out this mission were uh, such important figures as uh, Richard Griffith, but later uh, became one of the fathers of uh, Irish ge geology or uh, Alexander Nemo, a Scottish uh, civil engineer and geologist, who later undertook uh, some very important pioneering, pioneering uh, marine ge geological surveys of uh, offshore Southwest Britain and Southern, I Southern Ireland. Uh, this map shows that the, the surveyed area was divided into districts and that each of the 10 survey team uh, was responsible for uh, several districts. On this extract of the map made by John Longfield uh, for the Lovegera district, you can see that uh, the bogs are uh, well recognizable in brown color. And in general, um, although the maps are different depending on the surveyors, uh, the bogs are always uh, well, almost always well, well visible and delineated, and the maps in watercolor, uh, which makes them uh, as uh, easy to read uh, as a very beautiful document. Uh, these two figures here, uh, and most of the documents of the Bob Commission I'm going to show you, are taken from this great book uh, by the geographer Arnold Horner. In his book, in he in inventories the different maps that are available. He shows many extracts from them and comments this extract. He's a, he also offers many passager, passage, passages from the uh, Bob Commission reports and uh, from the uh, very instructive le uh, letters exchanged between the uh, surveyors and the commissioners. So here are other examples of the map that were produced. And what I want to, uh, to underline here is also um, that in addition to the better knowledge of the original peatland extent, uh, these, ma these Bob Commission maps also provide very valuable information uh, about how the, the bogs may have been, may have been transformed sub subsequently, uh, especially with the drainage schemes proposed by the, uh, by the surveyors. Um, here, uh, the proposed drains are drawn in red color, a bit everywhere in this extract of the Bob of Allen map. Uh, on this uh, extract of uh, Alexander Nimbo's map for the uh, River Kenmar area, uh, they are in straight black lines. Uh, you can find them here at the south of the Finnehy Bog and in the north along the Finnehy River. Um, we can guess really uh, from the density of the drains, especially on this map by Richard Griffith, um, how massive and uh, intense the recommended drainage operation were. Another piece of information which is important for us, but which is not uh, systematically provided by the maps, is the, the depth of the bog. Uh, on this map, uh, it is maybe difficult to, to read to read for you, but uh, in several locations, uh, we have a number indicating the depth at this point, at this specific point. Specific, specific point. And um, in this case, uh, a mean value or an average of values is also provided uh, in a table accompanying the map. Uh, of course, um, so, sorry, so of course, uh, our, our main material for this project are the maps, but uh, the uh, reports produced by the surveyors uh, also provide very complementary information to our field of interest. Uh, for example, we can find scaled section of turf, scaled section of turf bank of turf banks uh, with a more or less detailed uh, stratigraphic description. Uh, for example, here on the left, uh, you have a stratigraphic description of a 14 meters deep section, uh, recording nearly 12 meters of pit where different colors of pit are identified, uh, in which varying compactness, varying visibility of uh, most fibers are also described. In this cent uh, at the center, uh, in this drawing of uh, three and a half meters deep section, the uh, surveyor, uh, AIR, uh, describes the different um, 
different uh, strata of peat, and also three, uh, three distinct groups of peat found in the, in the various strata, in the various peat strata. Uh, their, uh, their roots and stems uh, were eroded, found remaining undisturbed uh, from the original situation uh, in which they grew. Um, other drawings are also very interesting for us. Uh, for example, this perspective view and uh, these cross sections showing uh, the rift that formed uh, in the bog of Rhine uh, after, uh, after, after a bird burst in uh, December uh, 2009. So you understand that uh, these bog commission maps uh, contain potentially some very uh, useful information. Uh, however, the, the first step is still uh, to access and collect the maps. Um, currently, uh, the, uh, most of the uh, significant proportion of the original, ma original, original maps are currently held by the uh, National Library, Library of Ireland. Uh, however, the uh, access to, see, to these originals um, is not easy. Uh, these are uh, fragile, uh, fragile and large documents, uh, and they may be too delicate or too degraded to be transformed and used safely. On the other hand, other institutions, such as the Ordnance Survey, uh, companies such as Bonner Mena, or uh, the map libraries of the of Trinity and Galway universities, have uh, reprints of the original maps that may be of sufficient quality uh, to, work on, to work on. Uh, when we will, uh, once we know uh, which maps can be used, uh, they need to be uh, digitized. Uh, we don't know uh, who will do this work, ourselves or the professionals of the organisms uh, owing the map. Um, and, that, and then we don't know yet uh, whether the map will be scanned, which, which would require a large scanner, or whether they will be uh, photographed with a high resolution, uh, stable and fixed camera. Uh, but what is sure is that this uh, digi digitizing process is a very important step um, because uh, high quality digitization uh, avoids distortions and uh, preserves the accuracy of the map. Secondly, the uh, georectification uh, is a, a step that is uh, also crucial, uh, obviously, for the, the, the quality of the, of the following uh, processing. Uh, a recent, uh, recent study uh, made by uh, Morley Wilmont on uh, 49 maps of the Bob Commission, uh, of the Bob Commission shows uh, that many of the maps are sufficiently detailed uh, to find enough uh, common and well-distributed ground control points. Uh, many of the maps are also uh, quite uh, consistent and accurate um, since the uh, overall mean, root mean square error that they obtained was 42 meters with the lowest values reaching uh, 5.6 meters. And uh, that despite, uh, despite the, the historical maps they used uh, were coming from different sources. So this is very, uh, very promising. Um, and uh, yeah, in addition to, uh, to the uh, exi already existing high resolution geospatial data sets, uh, field work uh, will also be uh, undertaken if uh, grand control points need to be uh, surveyed and collected uh, in the field to carry out the georectification geo and uh, to validate it. Uh, once the, uh, once the uh, georectification, uh, the quality of the georectification is uh, validated with independent checkpoints, uh, the idea is to extract the bug polygons and their boundaries. Uh, we, as seen earlier, uh, these are water color maps uh, where bugs are easily recognizable and have a well-defined spectral signature. Um, therefore, uh, we could then use a uh, semi-automatic cl image classification tool to, uh, to extract uh, these polygons and the bugs. Um, of course, extensive uh, field work will be uh, carried out, uh, including the GPS survey, uh, test pits of, in the soils, and uh, pit depth measurements. So these works will be carried out to uh, verify the accuracy of the boundaries and extent of pitlands uh, delineated with the uh, Bob Commission uh, polygons. Once uh, the accuracy, um, when the accuracy of uh, the pitland delineated with the Bob Commission maps will be uh, assured, uh, the, the map, the dataset can be used to uh, upgrade the derived average pit map. 
Other data will be used to improve uh, the map, uh, such as the latest land, uh, current, current land cover, the data from the soil information system, or the new uh, national land cover map produced by the uh, Ordnance Survey uh, and uh, due to be published this year. Uh, we could also use a uh, high resolution uh, satellite imagery from the uh, European program Copernic Copernicus uh, Sentinel 2, and maybe also some very high resolution uh, satellite images uh, accessed through the, uh, through the EarthNet program of the European Special Agency. So, this recent data set and high resolution data sets, uh, together uh, with uh, the derived Irish pit map, uh, must enable us to refine the uh, present-day extent of uh, peatland boundaries, so the boundaries of the current peatland extent, and comparing this present-day boundaries with the baseline extent provided by the Bog Commission maps, we should be able to locate uh, this uh, original peatland area where uh, the land use and the land cover have changed, and to assess how these converted peatlands have changed uh, whether forestry here or agriculture or pit extraction uh, has taken place, to what areal extent, and maybe uh, what uh, drainage scheme uh, has, been has been implemented uh, to enable uh, this land use change. Uh, perhaps also additional uh, data from the fieldworks will enable to assess to what extent this land use change has altered the, the, depth, the pit depth. So this, uh, this change detection study um, must uh, help to uh, produce a refined thematic map that would show both uh, the uh, relatively intact peatland and the, the current land cover and land use on converted peatlands. Uh, this work would be uh, in the continuity of a previous maps uh, produced by uh, John. And uh, yeah, based on this uh, thematic map, our ambition is to improve the estimates of greenhouse gas stocks and dynamics on peatlands, integrating the various uh, land use categories on converted peatlands and uh, the different uh, peatland types. Uh, to, for this purpose, uh, we plan to apply the emission factors provided by the uh, geodatabase uh, of the Intergovernmental Inter Panel on Climate Change. We can also uh, try to use the, the carbon density recently measured by uh, Ron Wilson and colleagues based uh, on the sampling of 50 sites across Ireland, so covering different peatland types, uh, different land use categories and drainage conditions. Our estimates could also be compared with the uh, emission estimates that will be uh, delivered by the Smartboard project and by the work of uh, Wahaj Habib, who is generating a high resolution, uh, normalized uh, different vegetation index maps. And finally, for the Wicklow Mountains in particular, uh, we could try to combine our results with the carbon densities calculated by uh, Holden and Connolly, uh, who also took into account the pit disturbance and uh, used the pit depth inference model. So um, this data constituting uh, our upgraded map of Irish peatlands, uh, our uh, thematic map with land use categories uh, on converted peatlands and uh, including uh, intact peatlands, or inventories of uh, greenhouse gas stocks and dynamics, all will be compiled, uh, compiled within a geodatabase. Uh, maybe later, um, uh, additional data uh, from further studies could complement uh, this database, for example, data on the drainage conditions or on the biodiversity and ownership status of the mapped areas. Uh, or uh, in, this, in this way, our aim is to build a tool that is easy to use uh, to identify uh, the most uh, suitable sites for revetting projects. This is really uh, in line with the work done uh, recently by Ron Wilson and colleagues and uh, quoted by uh, O'Connell and colleagues uh, to prioritize uh, the revetting operations. And this table uh, also highlights uh, the long-term issue of uh, the relating projects with a section here mentioning the difficulty of maintaining a high water level uh, on the on the related sites. So this is typically uh, the, the kind of important information uh, that would be worth including in the geo database in the future. Uh, in addition, the uh, information uh, contained in the geo database could also uh, help to determine uh, the restoration technique to be implemented. 
uh, is it more appropriate uh, to focus on blocking drains or should the barrier dam uh, be considered? And uh, should uh, vegetation restoration be also fostered, for example, uh, by inoculating uh, sphagnum moss? Um, we really want uh, our work to reach a wider audience than uh, just the scientific and uh, institutional community. Uh, that's why we will also focus on disseminating our results through more uh, mainstream channels, uh, social media uh, such as Twitter, popular journals. Uh, we are also creating a website uh, which will make it easy for anyone who wants information about the project uh, to find it. Uh, we will also use online media such as uh, our history map, which, um, which will enable us to, to provide a more interactive and visual uh, approach to our results. And in the last part of the project, we also intend to, intend to go and present our work uh, to um, the people interested and concerned by this topic and the uh, associated issues, uh, the landowners of peatland areas, the farmers, the environmental associations. And we plan to do this uh, presentation work uh, in different localities if possible. Uh, the roadshow uh, will include high resolution displays of the book commission maps and of the thematic map that we will have produced. Um, information will be uh, will accompany uh, these maps, uh, information on the different uh, historical context surrounding the land use changes that we present. Uh, our results on the uh, greenhouse gas stocks and dynamics on uh, intact and uh, converted peatlands will also be uh, presented. And of course, uh, the roadshow uh, will include uh, a stage, a stop for representation uh, in Trinity and uh, in Galloway University. So um, I had prepared several slides, several slides uh, about uh, my previous works and uh, experiences, but uh, I was uh, even slower than expected. So I'm really uh, just going to skim over uh, over this part. Um, so in a, in a brief few words, uh, I have a PhD in physical geography from the uh, Paris One University, a PhD with a focus in uh, fluvial geomorphology. I have done this PhD in the uh, Laboratory of Physical Geography, which is a really great place to work and to learn. Uh, I have uh, worked for several years in different universities as a research and teaching assistant uh, during my PhD and uh, after. Um, I would say that until now, my research has been related to uh, fluvial geomorphology, water management, environmental uh, geography, and geohistory. To be uh, concise, uh, um, I think I have uh, I've tried to really focus my work on the evolutionary uh, trajectory of hydrosystems uh, between uh, biophysical processes and uh, anthropogenic influences. Uh, as ex for example, uh, I have uh, I have worked on the history of resectioning and strengthening practices in Europe. Uh, I have tested the use of river sinuosity as an indicator of the anthropogenic disturbance of French River. Uh, I also spent a good amount of time working uh, in the Morvan region. Uh, this is an uh, ancient uh, granitic massif uh, located uh, in the east central France, uh, which is now a mid-medium elevation mountain um, uh, and the ter rural territory that is mainly occupied by forests and grasslands. And uh, in this region, uh, I have worked a lot on the hydrophological impact of past and current human activities at various um, spatial and time scales. Uh, among these activities were the, uh, the many water mills found, found along the rivers uh, that were built uh, for fueling, for grit and oil production, or that were um, smithies or sawmills. The log driving industry was also a very um, impactive and massive activity that uh, functioned intensively uh, for more than three centuries uh, in this region. Um, I have also studied a lot uh, the uh, specific multi-time scale influence of uh, various dams uh, on the uh, hydromorphological uh, conditions and processes uh, of the uh, Morvan rivers. And uh, I also have the chance uh, to monitor the morphosedimentary adjustment following a dam removal uh, in the reach below the dam, as well as uh, in the former reservoir. 
this was also a very exciting part of my research, and it was also very instructive with regard to the restoration process and what it means, um, especially when it applies to environment and systems uh, whose conditions have been solidly uh, changed, modified for many decades or many uh, centuries. Finally, um, I have uh, spent a lot of time studying the flow dynamics and investigating uh, the uh, driving processes of uh, bed load transport and morphodynamics and the interactions uh, between the two components, uh, mainly in uh, gravel bed rivers uh, uh, with uh, medium energy uh, context. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to end my presentation here because I want to, to keep time for the discussions. Uh, of course, I really uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention and uh, I will be, uh, sorry, <laughs> and I will be happy to uh, answer any question you might have uh, about uh, this research project and uh, all my, uh, my previous uh, works. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thanks, thanks Lee. Um, so uh, yeah, we have we have a good bit of time now for um, for questions. Um, uh, I think as well, if uh, if people want to indicate they have a question, then um, you can you can put it to Louis directly, or um, I don't mind uh, reading questions out either. Um. <coughs> uh, hi, yeah, uh, Tommy and Louis, uh, Rob O'Hara here, at Chagask. Um, just a few questions uh, and a few observations. Um, I missed the start, so apologies if you've covered this already, but are these national data sets or do they focus largely just on the bog locations? So you get the bog and the immediate hinterland or are, are, do they cover the whole, the whole country? Oh no! If you want, I can show you a, a, a map of the uh, of the book commission maps. <laughs> uh, and no, that doesn't cover the whole country. Uh, so it is um, it is here. So these are this, this is the extent of the uh, of the of the book commission maps. Okay, great. And I just see the date there, eighteen oh nine to eighteen fourteen. So. They were surveyed and, and produced in that time period, or uh, just produced? Were they surveyed much earlier? Uh, no, they were. Actually... So, the, for example, the ordnance survey maps were, were produced over forty years. Uh, was it the same year, or was it? Are these fairly tight to that time period? No, I, I think um, I think most of uh, maybe John will uh, will correct if I'm wrong, but I think most of the maps were uh, produced uh, before uh, or before or not after uh, 18, uh, 18, um, 14, uh, because uh, the first maps uh, were uh, delivered uh, by uh, 1811 um, or uh, 1812. Uh, so they, they were they, they were quickly surveyed and pretty quickly uh, uh, delivered too. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, I suppose just just to let you know, we we're doing something in the same kind of area at the moment uh, with um, first edition ordnance survey maps. Not, not specifically what what uh, you're doing. Uh, it's more of a segmentation exercise of historical maps, but there's definitely crossover. Oh, okay. It's good to know. I, I don't know if it's my uh, my computer, but I can't hear you very well. Uh, but I think I have noticed the main information. <laughs> it's good to know. I don't know if Tommy, you can hear me. Um, uh, yeah. Sorry, did I freeze? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, uh, just to say that we 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 we're, we're looking at something similar at the moment, um, and just to let John know as well, uh, and we're we're. A, a, bit on down the road with it, but uh, we, we have a lot more left to do. Uh, and we're looking actually at the first edition and second edition ordnance survey maps. Okay. Uh, so I think we should possibly have a chat at some point uh, um, together as a group and just see, is there anything we can do together with it? Yeah, totally. And the, the first uh, edition of the, um, 
the first uh, ordnance survey map is uh, 1837. The first edition ordnance survey maps were begun in the 19 in the 1830s. Yeah, to okay. the 18 like the mid 18th century, and then the second editions are up to 1914. Yeah. Okay. So I think if we have a data set as well, that's again another 40 or 50 years before the first edition ordnance survey. Uh, I think we can we can do something with that maybe together. So yeah, totally. Uh, I'll, I'll drop you an email. At some yeah, point. sure, yeah. sure. Thank you. Great. Any observations or interjections? I wonder if you could um, tell us a little bit about the, the context that the Bog Commissioner maps were created in the first place. Um, well, um, actually, I, I will uh, have trouble to to give you more details uh, that I, I, I did. You know, I, I was looking as if I was uh, knowing everything about uh, <laughs> the context of production. Uh, but no, yeah, I really I just know that there was in this context of the uh, wars against Napoleon's army and uh, uh, hemp and uh, and the flax needed to be produced for the British Navy to sail cloth. Uh, okay. And so ends this uh, this need to find a new uh, arable land. Right. Uh, without the idea was really to uh, why why uh, to drain uh, the bogs uh, because the idea was to to identify new arable land without encroaching on the lands that were already under cultivation. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I, I have one question. Please, yep. Yeah. yeah, so uh, Louis, you mentioned that uh, you will be using semi-automated digitization methods for um, uh, basically dig uh, digitizing the, the maps. Um, on, so I was wondering like, if, uh, if you'd be developing any tools or any methods to basically automatically georeference these, all these maps. Like once you have a scheme developed to, to map, uh, to uh, georeference one map, would you be using any sort of automated techniques to then, based on that, um, automatically you reference the map maps? Uh, well, for the uh, for the geo rectification process, um, I don't have in mind uh, automatic tools. Uh, um, I have I have uh, I have ideas for the uh, extraction the extraction of the polygons with uh, semi automatic uh, image classification tools. Or object image uh, analysis tool, uh, object based image analysis tools. But uh, for the geo rectification, um, I don't uh, see what uh, automating aut aut automated tools we could use. Um, maybe uh, you have an idea because actually I have um, always uh, ge referenced my historical maps um, in a manual way, uh, one by one. Uh, with the, the, the same uh, process, but uh, never, I would say, in an um, automatic call way. So um, I don't know, maybe you have a, a tool uh, that we could uh, we could use. Yeah, there are a few tools you could use. So like, yeah, uh, I, w one more question about that. Like if you're using semi-automated digitization, so when there's automation, then again, there's a question about the accuracy of the maps. So do you have, an, do you have any plan to then do the accuracy assessment? Because then it will be like semi-automated way. Uh, yeah, I think my um, my way of doing is pretty uh, uh, pretty classical. Well, the idea is to have uh, to have um, a good number of uh, well scattered and uh, distributed grand control points uh, for the geoactification process, and uh, then to uh, uh, verify the accuracy of the geoactification process uh, with uh, independent checkpoints. So that's to say. Um, uh, the current control points that will not uh, have been used for the uh, georectification process. Uh, I think it's pretty pretty classical. Uh, <laughs> there is maybe other ways, but um, I have never used it, uh, so I can't tell you uh, something else. I don't know if you have something else in mind or. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome.
We have a question from uh, Maeve in the chat, um, uh, um, which is already there, there's been a bit of engagement in the chat there. But uh, just to say that about um, about the roadshow and possible uh, collaboration with local peatland conservation groups, um, whether you anticipate working with community groups to share findings and outputs on specific areas. Uh, can you repeat the question? This is the last part. Sorry. Just uh, do you envision um, working with community groups in in the local areas where where the the um, where the bog lands in the maps are? Um, I uh, well uh, to to be honest, I don't know uh, really precisely yet uh, the uh, all the 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 organisms and uh, people uh, in this community although it is uh, not a very large community in Ireland but there is there are a lot of people working uh, and interested by peatlands in Ireland uh, so oh, yeah. uh, I, I, I can't uh, quote you some names of, <laughs> of course the people involved uh, the institutional people involved in this project uh, will be uh, we will do, do some presentation for them that's, uh, that's uh, the, the most normal things but um, I only know some names you know the uh, of associations such as the Irish Pitland Conservation Council mm. uh, I know that there is also the uh, farm pit farm pit project who is doing some very uh, interesting things um, yeah the Raceburg associations so I know um, some names of uh, I would say famous associations working on pitlands in Ireland but uh, uh, personally, I, I, I haven't, I haven't um, reached them uh, yet or anything, so I can be more precise. <laughs> Mary Toberty notes in the chat that uh, Trinity College Dublin was involved in the peatland conservation project in West Offaly in the 1980s, which looked at change in Mongan bog, and that would be potentially an interesting case study. I know that actually as well, in, in there is like very active uh, local groups in Offaly as well, in particular. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I uh, I write I write this down. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Henry Lamb says, "Very interesting talk, Louis. Look forward to hearing more as the project develops." Thank you. Good question here from um, Caroline Lawler. Uh, hi, Louis. Caroline here from the Farm Peace Project. Um, Missed the start of the presentation. Hope to catch recording. There will be a recording going up in the next uh, next few days. Um, and she says that we are active in the Midlands with local farmers around raised bogs. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that's one of the uh, organisms or associations that uh, I uh, whose I uh, I follow the the works and activities. So yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> but thank you. Very somebody notes as well that uh, Community Wetlands Forum represents community-based peatland groups and that they have a WhatsApp group. That might be helpful. Yeah, that's okay. cool. Actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, there, there, there are, there are a lot of people uh, involved in Pitland in Ireland. That's yeah, um, yeah. For me, who is new here, I was uh, pretty surprised. Yeah, but uh, that's uh, that's great. Do we have any uh, any? We've got five more minutes. If anyone wants to um, to come in with anything. Are you you asking to me? No, I'm just saying oh, to the floor, if anyone has any questions that, uh, or if there's anything you wanted to cover that maybe you didn't have time for that you would have liked to say in the presentation. Is there anything to a question, you know, it's like, uh, uh, is there yeah. anything you didn't get to cover or, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, more easy to be uh, to be questioned when you have results to present to present uh, and uh, to be contested. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I understand. And people need to eat too, so <laughs> maybe it's safe. <laughs> Great. Well, um, it seems like uh, your your comprehensive uh, presentation covered. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we'll say that. <laughs> Great. Well, um, yeah. Thanks for that. That was that was uh, really interesting. Well, th thanks, thanks to you uh, and all the uh, seminar team. And yeah, really look to forward to the following people. the project. Yeah, thank, thanks for all the people who, uh, who uh, have listened uh, to me. Cool. All right. Thanks. Thank you. We have one more uh, uh, comments from Maeve. Uh, just to say thanks again to Louis for a great presentation and great introduction to yourself and the project. Um, yeah, no, we all look forward to, to following it. Thank you, Maeve. Uh, I know she's nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rob O'Hara wants to know if uh, 
there's an email address um, maybe for uh, for contacting for uh, for the project. Sorry, that should say Louis. If you're struggling over my typo there, uh, so <laughs> you have you an email address there, Louis? I can get you at. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, this is my uh, first name, uh, Gilet uh, L, from the, the first letter of Louis. Gilet yeah. L uh, at tcd dot uh, e um, e e uh, high e. Sorry. Um, Great. Maybe maybe you can message uh, message yeah. it to Rob there in the chat. 